Woo-wee! Supply of money on NyQuil. Um, I guess the woo-wee is because there's NyQuil or something. Um, anyways, uh, let's talk about the supply of money. Last time we talked about the demand for money, so it really only makes sense. This time we should be talking about the supply of money. And uh, surprise, surprise, lo and behold, whatever you want to say, uh, the next lecture after this is going to be equilibrium money markets. Because once you talk about the demand for money and the supply of money, you might as well just go ahead and set them equal to each other, and then you get the equilibria. And that's you know kind of where the cool stuff starts to come into play. Now, the money supply is determined by a central bank. In the United States, it's the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, which we've, we've talked about a little bit so far in this course. Prior to a central bank, uh, the money supply would be determined by private banks who would issue their own currency. So if you banked with, like, I don't know, some regional, whatever, bank and trust, something or other, they would issue money in their currency. But now it's changed a little bit where the Federal Reserve uh, issues the money. They determine the money supply. So, you know, we just get U.S. dollars everywhere we go. And every bank will, you know, accept U.S. dollars as legal tender. And, um, well, yeah, that's what we got. So when we talk about the money supply... We're going to be assuming that the central bank controls the money supply uh, by setting a nominal quantity of money that will be assumed to be fixed at first, but later on we're going to relax that assumption. It's kind of like, let's, if you want to start, like if you want to talk about this stuff, best to start easy. We can go a little bit more complicated from there. So let's start out with a constant money supply equal to M with a bar over it. Remember, anything with a bar over it means it's just going to be constant. It's fixed. It's time invariant, so to say, or so to speak, whatever. So M is constant over time. So we're going to assume that the central bank is going to set some kind of a monetary aggregate and just keep it there. Now, really, in reality, this wouldn't be too terribly different from a gold standard. And they could choose to keep some broad monetary aggregate like M2 fixed, or they could choose something a little bit narrower, like, say, the money base, right? Because there are different measures of money. It's not like there's just one measure of money. Like, oh, well, boom, here's the money supply, and that's the only measure of the money supply. Well, if you remember from our first lecture, there's really a couple of things that we could or maybe could not assume would be part of the money supply. So they could, like, fix the money base, and just the money base is fixed. There it is. Or they could try to fix some monetary aggregate like M2, M1, something along those lines, right? Just some monetary aggregate would be fixed, and it would be controlled and maintained by the central bank where it's just fixed, and that's what it is. So they would still be conducting open market operations, but it would be to keep that monetary aggregate where it is. So there's no, like, let's set interest rates, like, let's raise interest rates or let's lower interest rates for this. Let's have accommodative monetary policy measures. You wouldn't have any of that. It's just keep the money supply, keep the monetary aggregate where it is, and that's that. So we would here have two different measures or two different uh, levels, really, of the money supply. We could set it at, say, $2 trillion for, you know, M1, or we could set it for, say, $4 trillion, M2. M2. Now, these, this isn't like M1, M2, like M1 money supply, M2 money supply. It's like just here's a possible level, here's another possible level. Now, when you look at this, right, note that it's fixed, right? So the money supply is fixed, and the money supply is essentially going to be the same regardless of what the interest rate is. In other words, the money supply is independent of the interest rate capital R. Remember, it's capital R because it's the nominal interest rate, not the real interest rate. So if the money supply is fixed, then the central bank doesn't set or control the interest rate, which would mean that the nominal rate would be determined by other things. What would it be determined by in this case? Well, it would be determined by where the money demand curve intersects with money supply. So the equilibrium would be determining what the nominal interest rate is, right? If money demand is very, very high, you would have a higher interest rate in this case. If money demand was lower, you would have a lower interest rate in this case. But what if the central bank 
wanted to change the money supply. All right, well, in this scenario, the central bank would adjust the money supply according to interest rates. If they wanted lower rates, they would increase the money supply, and if they wanted higher rates, they would decrease the money supply. Now, if any of you have been following the news in, well, recent months, but especially in the last couple of days, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States has been talking about raising interest rates. The reason they've been talking about raising interest rates is they've been extremely accommodative with their monetary policy, and we are now at a point where the rate of inflation is quite high. And it's so high that they're going like, okay, well, I think it's time to pump the brakes on these monetary policy measures. We need to slow that down, and then we need to hike rates. Thus, essentially, they're not quite decreasing the money supply, but they would be decreasing the rate of money growth. And we'll get into money growth in a couple of minutes, but um, I figured, you know, we could just sort of find a way to tie that into like what's actually happening in the real world right now. Now, if this happens, the money supply is still going to be vertical. It's vertical because the central bank sets the amount of money to be made available without consideration for the value of money. All right. In other words, what they're doing is they're setting the nominal quantity of money, but they're not setting the real quantity of money. They can't set the real quantity of money, only the nominal. So let's graph what it looks like when the central bank changes the supply of money to affect interest rates. But what I'm going to be doing is I'm also going to include the demand for money so you can see why an increase in the money supply will be changing interest rates. And it would be this right here. So we would have two different levels of the money supply, right? Two hypothetical um, levels for the money supply. One would be a lower money supply, smaller one, and it would have higher interest rates because the money demand curve and the money supply curve intersect at an interest rate that is RT double prime, right? That's a pretty high interest rate relative to, say, RT triple prime, which is where we've got the higher money supply that's intersecting with money demand a little bit further out in the demand curve, and it gives us a lower interest rate. Now, in a section of the lecture notes that I will be posting that correspond with this lecture video, I mentioned a situation where we could have a time variant version of the money supply, <clears throat> which means the central bank could actually change the growth rate of the money supply over time. In this case, the central bank would set money according to, let's say, this function here, m of t equals m naught times e to the mu t. Right? It looks like a goofy u, but it's a lowercase mu, mu, Greek letter. Where mu is the growth rate of the nominal quantity of money. A change to that growth rate, mu, would change the growth rate of the nominal quantity of money. If we increased mu, then the growth rate of money would increase. Therefore, if we decreased it, the growth rate of the money would decrease. And m0 is going to be the initial value of the money supply. So if we're starting at, say, right now, and we set the money supply equal to what it is right now, m0 would be equal to that. right? If, say, the money supply were, I don't know, a couple trillion dollars, say $10 trillion, then the money supply, M0, would be equal to $10 trillion. Now, I want to note that this representation is in continuous time, and we typically use discrete time in this type of study, and especially in this course, but continuous time representations are sometimes easier to write out and sometimes a little bit more intuitive. There are other times where discrete time becomes more intuitive, and I'll explain what the differences are between discrete and continuous time a little bit further on in this lecture. Now, if that equation's functional form looked a little familiar to you, whether you've taken some kind of a finance course before or you've decided to, you know, really torture yourself and take, like, differential equations, that functional form may look fairly familiar like this, a of t equals p times e to the rt, where a of t is the value of an asset at time t, p is the principal, r is the interest rate, and t is the amount of time that has gone by. This 
right here will tell us like, okay, if I were to say, save some amount P, right? I were to deposit that into a bank and interest compounds continuously. And I want to know what it would be worth in say 10 years at some constant interest rate R, I could use this function right here. I could use this equation to tell me what it would be worth in 10 years, right? How much value would it have picked up over that time given some nominal rate of return? So money growth in continuous time follows the same functional form of exponential growth and decay, which is kind of cool, I think. It's actually really interesting. If you ever take a differential equations course, it can be a little tough. Um, there were parts of it that were easy for me, parts of it that were very hard for me. But um, it was really interesting to see how a lot of these functional forms show up all over the place, right? Because anything with exponential growth and decay is likely to follow this function right here, a of t equals p times e to the rt, right? It would actually be, uh, God, what is it like? I think it was like y of t equals c times e to the kt is like the general functional form as a solution to a certain type of differential equation. I, I just think that's kind of cool, personally. Uh, but if you're not as much of a math nerd as I am, maybe you're just kind of, your eyes are glazing over, and you're like, geez, dude, come on, go to the next slide. So I'm just going to go to the next slide for you. So let's do an example of the money supply. Let's say the initial money supply, M0, is $100, and the growth rate of the money supply is 3% what would the value of the money supply be in five years? So t would be equal to five. Well, we're going to set it up as this, right? m naught is 100 times e to the 3%. So we do 0 0.03. So anytime you see this continuous time functional form and you want to know what to put in for the growth rate, if you see the growth rate is 3%, you don't put in 3 you're going to put in 0 0.03, right? It's going to be the decimal notation of 3%. And we're going to multiply that by how much time has gone by, which is 5. So it's 100 times e to the 0 0.03 times 5. Well, what's 0 0.03 times 5? Well, it's going to be 0.15. So we get 100 times e to the 0 0.15, which gives us, if we evaluate this, 116.18. So the money supply in five years will be equal to $116.18, given a 3% growth rate of the money supply per year. Let's see what happens if we were to increase the growth rate of money. I'm pretty sure we all know what would happen, but let's go through the math and just see it, you know, formally speaking. So let's say that now mu is 5%. All right, so it goes from 3% up to 5%. What's the value of the money supply in five years? Well, we set this up only instead of 0.03 for the interest rate, we set it as 0.05, right? So 0.05 times 5 is going to give me 0.25. So I get 100 times e to the 0.25, which gives me $128.40. So if we were to increase the growth rate of the money supply, over time, the money supply will end up being higher. So we changed the growth rate. Let's change the amount of time now. So let's say that mu is 3% again, but we want to change how much time goes by. What's the value of the money supply in 10 years rather than 5 years? Well, this time we set it up as 100 times e to the 0 0.03 times 10. All right, what's 0 0.03 times 10? Well, that's 0 0.3, so 100 times e 3 which gives me $134.98. Now, one thing that I do want to mention really quickly is, so if we've got m of t equals um, m naught times e to the mu times t, right? If t is equal to 10, and we've got m of t, we want to know what m of t is equal to. Well, t is equal to 10, so it's m of 10 years. So that's why you see 10 in the parentheses on the left-hand side, because it's m of 10 years. So how long does it take for the money supply to double? Well, if we want a doubled money supply from this, from m of t equals m naught times e to the mu t, 
we would just say that m of t is equal to 2 times m naught, right? Because the money supply would be doubled. So I just set that up as 2 times m naught equals m naught times e to the mu t. I don't know why there's a zero in there. My apologies for that zero. It's not supposed to be there. We divide both sides by m naught, and we get 2 times m naught over m naught equals e to the mu t. which gives me, right, m0 over m0 just equal to 1, so I get 2 equals e to the mu t. And I want to get rid of that exponential because oh, that's going to be kind of tough to try to solve everything out with that exponential if I'm solving for t. So I'm going to take the natural log of both sides because, remember, the natural log undoes the exponential. So if we have get e to the mu t and I want to undo that, the natural log of e to the mu t is going to be equal to mu times t. So I take the natural log of both sides. The natural log of 2 equals the natural log of e to the mu t. And I get the natural log of 2 equals mu times t. Now I want to solve for t, so I divide both sides by mu, the growth rate, which gives me the natural log of 2 over the growth rate equals t. This is where we evaluate what the natural log of 2 is, and it's 0 0.693. So the amount of time it takes to double or the number of years it will take to double the money supply given a growth rate mu is 0 0.693 divided by that growth rate. So with an interest rate of 3%, I would just plug in 0 0.03 for mu, and I get 0 0.693 divided by 0 0.03 equals 21 years to double the money supply given a growth rate of 3% per year. Now, <clears throat> in reality, time is continuous, right? I could really get into the depths of this and you know talk about like Minkowski space and all that, but this ain't a physics class. We're not doing physics here. We're doing economics. And we can only monitor the data in discrete points in time. So while in reality time is in fact continuous, the data points that we have are sometimes separated by a month. They can be separated by a quarter. In some cases, it's separated by like a year. All right? I've got a paper in my dissertation that uh, the data are separated by 10 years. It wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense to fit a continuous time model to something that's got data observations that are spaced out by a decade. So sometimes it becomes more convenient to deal with these problems in discrete time. In discrete time, the equation for the growth in the money supply would look like this. m with a little subscript t equals m naught times 1 plus mu to the power of t. This is the discrete time analog to the continuous time representation that you saw in the previous slides. So let's do an example with this guy over on the next page. Suppose we let m naught equal 100, mu equals 0 0.03, and t equals 5. So it's the exact same setup as what we have, or the same values going into the function as what we had on our first example. But the functional form here is going to be a little bit different. I get 100 times 1 plus 0.03 to the power of 5, which gives me 100 times 1.03 to the fifth power. And when I evaluate this out, I get $115.93. And we can see this is a little different than what we got in continuous time. Now, why is that? Well, I had said that discrete time can sometimes be more useful, even though continuous time is the exact measure. So, like, what gives here? Why would we want to use discrete time? Well, discrete time is an approximation of values in continuous time, but we use discrete time more because the data are discrete and sometimes really far apart in time and also because it can be a lot easier mathematically. Many of these models involve fairly advanced differential equations that are almost impossible to solve in continuous time and need some kind of numerical methods. I'm not going to put you guys through that. That would be awful. But in discrete time, we don't have differential equations. We've got difference equations, which are sometimes a lot easier to solve out. So we use discrete time more often than not in classes kind of like this. So let's talk about a little notation about discrete and continuous time. In discrete time, we use a subscript of t, say t plus 1, t plus 2, etc., giving us, like, say, m, a little subscript t there. t 
continuous time, there is no next element, right? There's no t plus 1, t plus 2, so we use m of t instead because t is continuous. In discrete time, there's always a next element because for a discrete set, it's countable, meaning each point is isolated and there exists some neighborhood, which is like an infinitesimally small distance around that point, that doesn't contain any other points in the set. This would be here, zero would be a discrete point because if we push out a little bit, that little red circle, right, there's nothing else in the set around that circle, so it's a discrete point. So zero is discrete, there's nothing next to it. But the interval between one and two is continuous because there is something next to it. There's no next element. And what do I mean by this? Well, what I mean is that every point you think could be closest to, say, one, is going to have something in between those points that's even closer. Example, if you think 1.00000001 is the closest to 1, well, I can take that distance of 0.00000001 and divide that by 2, and I would get a point that's even closer to 1. And I can divide that distance by 2 and get something even closer, and on and on and on and on and on. It goes on forever. Therefore, I will never get to what the next point is. Now, as I have said, ad nauseum at this point, we primarily use discrete time in this class because it's going to be easier for us almost across the board. And in this application, it's going to be more intuitive in the long run. And the notation, as I have said, is the following. m sub t for today, m t plus 1 for tomorrow, m sub t plus 2 for, say, two days in the future, etc. Continuous time is different. The notation is m of t. And there is no m of t plus 1 because there's no next element in that set. So we would have to use a derivative with respect to time. So d m of t over dt equals m with a little dot over it of t. But honestly, that's just too much calculus. right? You guys are going to have to do a little bit of calculus here and there in this class, but I don't want to like blast you with all this other calculus that's essentially unnecessary because we can get similar things in discrete time without having to take any derivatives. Now, this is going to wrap up the supply of money for now. Next time, we're going to talk about equilibrium in money markets and how this affects economic variables like inflation, expected inflation, price level indeterminacy, all that fun stuff. And we're then going to talk about some principles of monetary economics and investigate some short and long-run relationships between money and other economic variables like output and inflation. We'll then cover the quantity theory of money, talk about what's good about it, what's not so good about it, and address some criticisms. And then we'll talk about Milton Friedman's work on the optimal quantity of money and where and when it would be useful in various applications of monetary economics. So with that said, this concludes the lecture. Thank you for watching, and the next lecture will be up, I don't know, whenever the next lecture is up. So thank you for watching.